I'll give a short introduction and then start with the first question. So in November 2008, I made live recordings with Jake and Dennis Chapman in the run-up to the Memento Moronica show in Hanover. The theme, how could it be otherwise, the hell and its inmates. Hell was a huge sculpture containing several thousand toy figures arranged in nine glasses laid out in the shape of a turned swastika. After the first hell burned down in a warehouse fire, the Chapman started with a new version, Fucking Hell, which was shown 2008 in the exhibition If Hitler had been a hippie, how happy would we be in London? Why Hitler again and again, and why all this cruelty in the work of the Chapmans? And why a third hell, hell 65 million years BC, with cardboard dinosaurs? From Hell to Hell, an audio CD that was the result of the interview contains first answers to these questions. I start with one. As soon as we realized that hell had actually been burned, we didn't want the, the work to become iconic. Immediately we said, well, we're going to remake hell. The fact, that, the fact was that hell, burning down in a warehouse fire in 2004, had done the Chapmans a huge service. It took four and a half years to rebuild hell, but besides improving their technical skills, they realized that hell was an ongoing process. It's like a repository of everything in miniature. When they first saw fucking hell, some people cried because it reminded them of the Second World War. Someone came in the first day and threatened to destroy it, all because there were no Jews in it. But there were no mutants in the Second World War, no skeletons that walk around, and obviously no McDonald's restaurant. There are no Jews, there are no Nazis, it's a model. Jake and Dennis Chapman use generic terms like happiness or evil, Nazism, fascism, a swastika, or a smiley face, and push them to the point where they collapse. The work expands into areas of utter impoverishment and valuelessness. Fucking hell is an attempt to make chaos out of chaos because chaos is the natural state of thing. One can't look at fucking hell without looking at hell 65 million years BC. And the latest works with animals that I saw on a studio visit in London last year, probably crueler versions than fucking hell because they are saying that anthropomorphic extinction and genocide is already inscribed in nature. When you look above the dinosaurs in hell 65 million years BC, there's a meteor, the imminent end of the dinosaurs. So all questions of purpose become absurd once you realize that the sun will eventually engulf the earth. But once you notice that everything becomes meaningless in face of imminent heat death, biology can then just be pleasure without enlightened notions of progress. We don't make any attempt to make things better. We are not interested in curing anything. If anything, we are interested in making things worse. This evening talk is about hell as a model and how key figures of the Chapman's work like Adolf Hitler, Ronald McDonald, or the painter Francisco Goya may function as role models. For your information, the lecture will be recorded and later be made available on our Artifacted channel. Hope that's fine sure. for you too. And now I'm honored to, to welcome Jake Chapman, who came specially from London today to join tonight's Artifacted talk. Let's start with the title of our conversation Hell is a Model. Sure. It's a remark by you and Dinas from the interview we did in 2008. Hell is a model or a repository, a depot, but what a model or what a repository? It's not a representation of anything in the world, for example, the Holocaust or literally hell itself. By the way, the reason it was called hell was because the first thing that people said was fucking hell when they saw it. But what a model or what a repository, what kind of repository is it? Um, the, the idea of being an artist for us is, 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 is something to do with um, primarily before a consideration of anything else, a consideration of the notion of representation. The idea of a, a critique or a critical approach to what's possible in terms of making art. Um, and considering what art is, considering how important it is as, a, as, a, as an activity that, as far as we're concerned, is synonymous with the discourses of philosophy, that we tend towards things which are 
uh, less than, as I said before, um, you know, painting pictures of puppies than trying to deal with uh, some of the meta-narratives of the 20th century. Um, the idea of hell, then, um, as a, 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 a sculpture that operated by a magnitude of small scale but portended to the idea of trying to represent something on the scale of the magnitude of industrial genocide. It's not just something to do with the content of the work, it's also to do with the idea of um, testing the capacity of a work of art to actually carry out a representational uh, um, uh, summation of the 20th century. You know? um, and I think that you know, the, the, the point being that the work, the work by reducing the scale of the 20th century down to the domain of play, um, you know, that you have this sculpture which, which seems to want to describe everything that happened in the 20th century, but in a sense, it's kind of, it's already rendered pathetic by the fact that the materials are already impoverished. You know, they're already just toy soldiers. Um, and I guess one of the things that we're interested in is the degree to which um, humans, in their reaction to things like representational forms like art, that they tend towards very um, easy forms of emotional uh, emotional um, projection that they kind of that they they have a cathartic experience when they see a work of art that makes them kind of weep or cry. And I guess that what we're interested interested in doing is is testing that 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 capacity to kind of extort feelings of pathos on the part of humans. In in fucking hell, the film that one can see in the small room on the fourth floor an untalented megalomaniac art teacher decided to enter the warehouse and to burn hell. Is that story a kind of sublimation for you and Dean is to explain the case that hell, your masterpiece or your masterpiece was destroyed without any sense? You once said that the idea of God responding to a work of yours and feeling so moved by it to actually cause it to burn might have helped incite you to react against God and make further hellish things. Is um, it? Yeah, I mean I think that um You know, the, 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 in terms of in terms of the of the of the actual dynamic of making the work, that what we're interested in is, I mean, I'm not, I can't sort of speak for um, the reasons why God might have chosen to burn the work. Um, uh, is the idea of saying that you know that if you, the, the reason that we kind of gravitated towards the idea of industrial genocide is because it seemed to be to us the most important event of the 20th century, or at least the single most purposeful in terms of. The, the fact that the, the principles of enlightenment, of, of scientific rationality that motivated national socialism to produce a, uh, a, a model of, of enlightened, enlightened uh, industrial genocide seemed to us to be a thing that hasn't kind of effectively ended. In a sense that what happens with industrial genocide is that you have, um, you know, you, you have almost the embodiment of all of the aims and the motivations of the enlightenment but motivated towards obviously negative ends. I mean, the, I guess why we're still interested in that is because it seems to me that, that some of the notions of progress, the teleology, teleology of progress that we still, that still inhabit us now, this notion that we're motivated put towards some point in time when, when uh, rational information will kind of, will, will turn us into civilized beings, that these ideas are still inherent in national, national socialist thinking. And they're also, they're also uh, embedded in the em embryonic beginnings of the Enlightenment. So instead of that work really being a kind of uh, uh, an illustration or a, 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 an excavation of the idea of, of the Holocaust as a, as a historical event, it's more to do with trying to, I guess, um, exercise concepts of the, of the Enlightenment to try and kind of draw those ideas out to make, to make it apparent that these things are not, that, that the, the, the idea of, uh, of an industrial genocide is not a moment of psychosis, it's actually the embodiment of all of the methods and mechanisms of the Enlightenment which, which are still in process today. Oh. Oh, by the way, is it... Um, oh, yeah, I didn't really answer the thing about the burning and God. Um, exactly. Is it, well, is it a kind of sublimation for it, you? Is it, is it an explanation why I, this happened? I mean, I think any sense. Yeah, I mean, I think the burning. I mean, it was you know, it wasn't a, it wasn't a kind of a, a joke or an irony sort of passed on us that when uh, I think a journalist phoned up and said, you know, that they'd heard that the, 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 there was this fire and this this work had burned that they actually you know they said, is it true that hell hell's on fire? Mm. Um, which seemed quite obvious that you know, hell is always on fire. <laughs> um, 
Um, and I kind of like, quite like the idea that actually part of, the, part of the content of the work is not so much its pictorial content, it's not what the work represents, it's not the thing in the world that it's synonymous for or metaphoric for, it's also the fact that what we do as the artists to produce it, take two or three years to make the work, is that the content is also to do with the subordination of our labour to the task of making the work. Mm -hmm. So the content is not only this notion of, of of industrial genocide, the subordination to slavish acts. It's just also that the artists who are producing this work, that the content of their lives become the content of the work. So in a sense, the work is performative, not just simply pictorial. In fact, the pictorialness of the work is the one place in which the work kind of fails miserably. Um, I mean, I keep, I, there's, a, there's the one kind of um, uh, statistical comparison that I make in terms of the idea of the temporal relationship of the work in relation to the reality of something like Holocaust. I think that um, I think 90,000 uh, Russian prisoners of war were killed in six hours, and it takes us to produce 50,000 figures on the scale of one thirty-second to produce a work of art that takes three and a half years to make. So it, what's interesting about that is that it shows that the representational capacity of a work of art falls miserably to actually enact the pathos of reality. So the point of the work is, is to produce this kind of grand meta-narrative of the 20th century that somehow does nothing more than kind of uh, demonstrate the absurdity and the impossibility of a work of art to say anything at all. But, uh, what, but, but, by, by the way, uh, I once made an interview with, with Slava Zizek in, yeah. in Ljubljana and he was fascinated by, by me reading these things because yeah. he thought it was in a kind of Stalinistic trial. Right. So you are accused for making art that's what it is, no, no. I mean, I, I, what I it is about. But what, what would you say is the, the reason that, that art and violence is so intrinsically connected, not only in modernity? Is violence much more fascinating than everyday life? I think that, you know, I think that in, in terms of what scientific rationalism can produce in terms of a coherent notion of how we use reason to unpick the world, to unpick nature, as though somehow nature is presented to us as a, some, some kind of latent code in which scientific rationality will unpick and reveal the truth, is that there's still some kind of, uh, there's some, you know, some notions of some excess, some surplus, which doesn't fit into that regime of, of, of logic. And then I guess that things like violence um, exists outside of that notion of progressive thinking, that somehow violence can't be recuperated to any kind of uh, utilitarian moral outcome unless it's recuperated by the logic of appropriation, in which, in which case it does, because then you have uh, you know, the, relationship, or the, the, the relationship between systemic violence and divine violence. Systemic violence is violence that's used by the state to further its aims. Divine violence is, the, is, the, is when you have a schizophrenic running around murdering people for no purpose. And the reason it's divine is because it serves no purpose. It's beyond purpose. I, have, I was having a conversation with someone the other day and this kind of notion of why, why violence seems to have some kind of, you know, it vacillates in some kind of metaphysical way in terms of having some kind of truthfulness, but an uncomfortable kind of truthfulness in terms of how, you know, how humans kind of resolve this notion of what they are and how they, how they, uh, how they correspond to their reality. Um, and I was thinking that this, this idea that, you know, that looking for life on Mars was some time ago, that someone said, I don't know, was it... Um, Lovelock, the guy who wrote Gaia Theory. So I think he was questioned about it, and he kind of suggested, he said, well, if you look at Mars, he said that here's a, here's a, here's a, here's a, here's a planet that's, kind of, that's achieved equilibrium. It has stability. And that anything that, is, anything that achieves equilibrium and stability has no life, because what's necessary to life is a far from equilibrial system that, that, is, that is, by its very nature, by its very, by its very tendency, aggressive and violent. Mm. So, you know, if you're a Martian looking at planet Earth and working out whether there's life on Earth, what you might find is that part of your, your, your way in which you could determine symptomatic kind of, you know, maneuverings of human life is that you would be able to detect violence on Earth. So violence, not just anthropomorphic violence, but natural violence oh. in terms of a far from equilibrial state on, on Earth would be the very, very mechanisms by which you know that there would be life there. Mm. So in a sense, the, the part, of the, part of the problem or part of the kind of, I guess, the, uh, uh, the, the kind of the, the general fascination with concepts of violence is that it seems to be a kind of uh, an eruptive energetic force 
that doesn't seem to be able to be leashed to uh, progressive notions of civilized conduct, you know. And yet, at the same time, it does. It's it's kind of it's kind of primary in its function in order to organize the planet in the way in which we want to, in terms of the fact that you know we live within a kind of uh, a sense of tranquility, but it's afforded by extreme forms of violence on the out, outside surface of our, of our civilized conduct, oh. you know. So, you know, it's a, it's a kind of, I mean, Zizek would say it's the dark underbelly, un, dark underbelly of, of a tranquil society, oh. that, you know, that violence is not a kind of, it's not a kind of a, a suppressed truth, it's the truth, it's the absolute truth, because it's the truth upon which all other forms of, of logic and reasonability are based. Hmm. Um, for Jonathan Meese, who was our guest in, in May, art is everything which, is, which exists in the realm of play. Um, that's what the dictatorship of art is about. Yours and Dino's work with toy soldiers is in the first place apparently the most inappropriate form one can think of, but I'm sure it has come from the same idea. These chopped up and remodeled toys only exist in the realm of play, so to say. Am I right? Is it important for you that there's a border between um, yeah, I mean, play I think, and reality? Um, no, I think, I think reality and play are, 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 are totally inter intermingled. I don't think that, I mean, I think that, um, you know, I mean, the idea of chopping up soldiers, I mean, it, it automatically sounds wrong, doesn't it? Chopping up toy soldiers. I mean, if you have a child that chops up toy soldiers, you probably want to take them to a therapist. You'd kind of be worried about them chopping up. You know, the idea that a, 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 a child has soldiers is quite worrying anyway, but the idea of them chopping them up would be even more worrying. Um, I mean, I think that part of what we're, we, the, you know, the, the causes of us, the reasons for us to use toy soldiers and to chop them up is to somehow, you know, is to somehow, um, is to, you know, is to, you know, certainly to, in terms of the magnitude of those works that incorporate, you know, thousands and thousands of figures, is that, you know, th that what, what's funny about the relationship between the work and people viewing the work is that the work somehow, even though these little figures are, grossly impoverished, you know, not, they, don't, they have the uh, expressive capacity of, of an ant, you know, in terms of their real kind of actual expressive content. And yet, if you put 50,000 of them, of them on a diorama and you make them do awful things to each other, you can extort real, genuine, sincere feelings of empathy on the part of the viewer, you know. So we're interested in the degree to which, you know, the idiocy of the viewer is being encouraged by the work that what, what will happen is that when people look at these things that they will they will they will exhibit real sincere earnest emotions towards things which don't deserve that kind of um, that that kind of uh, treatment you know so in a sense the idea of you know we're kind of interested in in in, in how works of art or how uh, impoverished representations like for example a smiley face can make someone happy just by simply some symbiotic relation in which the viewer is so thoroughly invested in the idiocy of representation that they accept it to be true, you know? So that, you know, so simply uh, to do, to, to, to make a nasty work of art, you just simply incorporate a swastika so every, everyone knows that's the embodiment of evil. So we're very interested in how these generic terms are causal in, actu in, in having actual responses on the part of viewers, you know? That, it, you know, that, The, the kind of the, the, the capacity of, of uh, you know a toy soldier to extort empathy from the part of a viewer on the part of a viewer for us is a description is a definition of how you know how kind of latently psychotic people are you know mm. I mean I've said it many many times that you know the idea of drawing a stick person with a you know a dagger coming out of their head you know that if you showed someone that this picture to someone and they started crying you know that they would probably be kind of have some kind of you know, there'd be some kind of psychotic episode oh. and they probably need some kind of help because the 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 effective uh the effective um valence the effective uh, representational skill of that drawing would be zero and that the person who would have some kind of human empathetic response to it would probably be misplaced there. Oh. But if but if then if you then you paint lots of little soldiers and you put them on a diorama and then you elicit this kind of response from people, it's not much different. Oh. It's really not much different. Um, and also the idea of using little soldiers is that you 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 you're, you're, you produce something which allows people to overcome their moral 
um, discomfort with the, with the idea of being voyeuristic. Mm. You know, if you look at, if, if, if people look at images of, of things which they feel morally bound to look away from, you're not really engaging them. They're, what's also quite funny about the, the hell sculptures is that, um, you know, that, that, that the idea of the permission given to someone to look at these things is something to do with the fact that because these things are locked into oh, uh, exactly. uh, glass Glasses, vitrines, yes. that it produces a kind of a, 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 a kind of um, a, a separate world in which the viewer becomes, rather than just the subjective person making their decision, they become slightly kind of um, omnipotent. They kind of have a god's eye view, and that affords them a sense in which their voyeurism is without kind of moral moral um, reduction. That they feel compelled and they feel enabled by the idea of being able to look over these vast images of kind of atrocity as though somehow, you know, because they are, they've taken this kind of divine sort of superior position in terms of their scale, mm. that it permits them to look at every detail without any mm. kind of moral restriction. Mm. Um, and also the idea of, you know, that, that, that in terms of the magnitude of scale, the idea of, of, of having people look at something which is blatantly... Uh, you know, criminal in terms of the fact that what you've done by reducing things to this scale is that you've robbed existential death of its true magnitude, of its true scale, you know, which actually it's an overlooked sort of fact of the work that, you know, uh, that, that ultimately there's a kind of, you know, that the, the viewer is, the viewer is somehow, um, is somehow uh, collaborating in looking at something which they ultimately shouldn't be looking at. Mm. Um, besides Ronald McDonald, Hitler is a key figure yeah. in your health, starting with fucking hell over and over again. Let me tell you a joke about Hitler. I'm not really good in telling jokes, but this one comes from Martin Kippenberger, so it's a good joke. Kippenberger, the, the drunk as always, philosophizes about heaven and hell and the place he wants to be after death. Of course, heaven. It's absolutely clear for him because Hitler is in hell. What's the argument? The joke goes like this. Hitler is asked to choose a room in hell we should stay forever. Do you know that one? No, I don't. No, okay. Several options are possible. Uh, there are lots of rooms with all kinds of tortures, like in the in Goya's Disasters of War, tortures which he obviously don't like. Then the keepers show him a room which is just filled with shit, stinky, wormy shit, and where the damned souls are standing up to their knees in that shitty brew. And Hitler says, well, that's not bad for eternity. I take it. And then after a while, the hell guard shouts, break his overhead stand, everybody upside down again. So that's a joke. And is Hitler, the question is, is Hitler the most evil you can think about, the filthy swine of history, as painter Daniel Richter once called him? Is he representing the most evil? Um, I mean, I, I, think it, I think Hitler is the, is the, is the caricature of the embodiment of evil. Mm. But I think what's interesting about Hitler um, is the notion that we have to investigate the, 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 the problem of, of, of a kind of a, a retrospective look at history and how, it, how events happen, is that we kind of very quickly pathologize uh, the individual in order to make um, some kind of account for how, you know, the idea of saying, you know, well, what, does, what does Hitler represent? Does he represent, you know, because there's, a, there's this kind of, uh, this notion that somehow because he was, uh, I mean, I don't know if this is just a kind of a caricature from across the water, a very English view, but there's this kind of, the running currency is that somehow that here's Hitler and that he wanted to be an artist, mm. you know? And that this notion of that his desire to be an artist, that his, his abject failure as an artist became his abject success as a genocider, you know? So somehow there's something very quite, there's something quite, as an artist, there's something quite interesting about the notion of, of, of the, the, the relationship between creation and destruction in that kind of binary shift from the failure of being creative to the success of being destructive, mm. you know? Um, that is it implicit in the raging desire to be creative that it's also uh, implicit to have a raging desire to be destructive? Or is this some kind of absurd romantic uh, notion of, of, of human pathology, you know? Um, I think also one of the things that we're kind of interested in uh, with Hitler is the idea of saying, especially because we've made work with his, his, his watercolors, we, I mean, I don't know if, if maybe you know, but um, we, 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 we procured, we found, we got hold of a whole bunch of, you know, supposedly um, uh, Hitler 
watercolors and we, we drew on them. Um, and we drew um, rainbows and you know nice things on them, knowing that in this instance, the worst thing we could ever do was to do something really nice. You know, the, the idea of that everyone here was, was rainbows. Oh, yeah. That's, That's nice. one. That's lovely. Uh, um, so, so the idea of saying that you know, I think what we're interested in is 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 the idea of saying, well, you know, um, you know, if, you, if how does a work of art work? You know, it goes back to this. For us, you know, if you look at a Van Gogh painting of, of some flowers, and you look at this painting with the sense in which there's some um, symptomatic, effective way in which the viewer can see the madness in the paintings, because the paintings are painted in a, in a particular way, that what the viewer can really, absolutely detect empirically from their observation of this thing is that they can sense the insanity of the artist. That the artist's work is in itself an index of insanity. Um, See, I kind of don't agree that that's the case, because I don't think there's anything insane about Van Gogh's paintings. And I, the, the reason I, the evidence I have is, is Adolf Hitler, you know. Because you'd have thought that here is this man who, in terms of the 20th century, has a, 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 an abundance of pathology, an abundance of insanity, apparently, you know, if we follow the romantic uh, interpretation of Hitler as this kind of pathological insane man, you know, that you'd expect that if you looked at his works of art, if his, his, his little drawings and his watercolours and his oil colours, that you would notice that there would be some pathology in there, some insanity, some madness in there that would put Van Gogh to shame. And yet, when you look at Hitler's drawings and his kind of, you know, terrible watercolours, they are blank, they're benign, there is nothing in them that demonstrates any tendency in the work of art to describe the insanity of the artist. You once said he's a perfect candidate for Clement Greenberg's description of modernism, <laughs> <Did> local <laughs> flatness. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a good thing to say. Yeah. But, um, but, but, but of course, you're, oh, well, you're I right. Think, I think it's, it's a cliche. Well, I it's, think also, yeah, also yeah. one of the other things is that, you know, is that, is that um, you know, this idea of, you know, that even in terms of the, you know, the, 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 the he, Hitler, in terms of the 20th century, would be for all of us probably the most self-identical entity known in, in modern history. That the idea of what Hitler is is because he, because he he is he, he there's no excess to Hitler in terms of the representation of him in terms of what's known about the the existential identity known as Hitler. He's kind of um, he is so obliterated in terms of his, his overexposed representation as a form, as a thing, as an image, as a thing known in terms of his kind of, you know, the, 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 the limitations of images of him, which then uh, become absolute in their final fixing of this character. And yet when you look at some of these kind of strange and backlogs of paintings that people have or sketches and stuff, and they're, they're, I mean, the brilliant thing is that, is that they're endless. They're, they're, Hitler ostensibly has produced more paintings and more pictures than, than probably, uh, you know, 500 artists. And so, in a, in a sense, the idea of what's interesting is that you have this kind of, you have this absolutely rigid, absolute rigid core of this person, who 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 is, as I said, self-identical, yet produces this this body of work which ranges from someone who is blind, drawing with their left hand to someone who's really good at drawing, to someone who smears paint with their fingers. To, so in a, in a sense, he becomes kind of like a, a almost like a, a, a vertiginous description of the whole of modernity, mm. you, know, you know? So, yeah. Mm. I, I think you're right that the, the failed artist can be psychologically damaged and then he wants to destroy everything. Yeah. That's a crazy idea, but obviously well, he, it's, he it's becomes, a cliche. But he becomes yeah? a, I mean, exactly, he yeah. becomes a very good, he becomes, I mean, Hitler is just a very good tool for challenging some of the claims made about what art does. You know, mm. he's a kind of very fantastically blunt instrument to mm. kind of then sort of suggest, you know, you know that if, 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 if that, that, that because, because then when you unwind, I guess what I'm suggesting is that when you unwind the approach to someone like Goya or the approach to someone like Van Gogh or the approach to any kind of lunatic modernist artist who's kind of, who is, who has, who is, who is understood and analyzed in terms of some kind of romantic pathos, that they're tormented, oh. um, that they're racked with some kind of creative genius. But in the case of, 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 of Hitler, when you unwind that, you kind of see that there's no pathology in the work, that the work can be as as um, as 
bereft of any kind of madness, and yet the person can go on and do the maddest thing in the 20th century. Whereas, you know, go, uh, you know Van Gogh chopped his ear off. Yeah, you I can mean, find these, not, these images not, in, in terms of you know, every anthology. Yeah. That's not a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but obviously, it's a cliche. But it's it's a fact that every single dictator of the 20th century was somehow connected to art. It's really a fact. Most of them wrote uh, mostly in po uh, poets, yeah, sure. writing writing poems. Uh, and it's a long list, starting with Gabriel D'Annunzio, it's Mussolini, Stalin, Hitler, it's Mao Zedong, it's Kim mm. Il Sung, Gaddafi, Saddam Hussein, or even figures like Radovan Karadzic. He was a poet too, well, he's a poet too, and the last dictator of Turkmenistan, I think that's more than just a coincidence, has it we got can to imagine do with Trump's creativity, poetry. or what is it? Ma creative. Imagine Donald Trump's poetry. Yes, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 doubt, I thought about doubt, questions about lines. Donald Trump, yeah. but we'll get that for sure. Yes, say something about Donald Trump. Yeah. Is he, is he a, a bad performance artist, and what will he be good at? Trump. Building fences, or... <laughs> I don't know what he's good at. I mean, I think, I mean, what I, I mean, I just was watching it the other day, kind of working out that part of the problem with, I mean, we can slide too quickly into this conversation about Trump, but I mean, you know, <laughs> just this, this notion that somehow, you know, somehow this kind of, this cosmic tilt to the right that we're suddenly all surprised about. You know, why are we surprised by it? Why, I mean, it's been, it's been the failure of the left and the failure of the middle for the past 20 years or 30 years or 40 years or 50 years to kind of construct a political argument against this resurgence, resurgence of right-wing thinking. Um, you know, that, that, that really, that if you think about all the, all the left, or the, you know, when I say left in America, I mean probably slightly right of middle, um, that the left, you know, the left in, in America, all they had in terms of their uh, resistance against someone like Trump was actually an aesthetic attack. They laughed at what he looked like, as though somehow the notion of middle class kind of politics is reduced to aesthetics, that, that some, somehow that exactly. the, even his morality became yeah. an aesthetic issue, that what he looks like, and that's, 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 not polit that's, not a political, that's not political engagement. But I was laughing at the idea that actually, that, that I kind of was thinking, what, what, what is so strange about his hand movements? <laughs> Because he has these kind of very strange, that they're kind of slightly almost like orthodox I, um, icon images of the, you know, these kind of strange, that there are these very strange sort of um, catastrophic uh, um, sort of porous leakages where maybe part of the reason that people kind of move towards him was some kind of holy reverence is because he kind of looks like an orthodox kind of icon. But I sort of also realized that, that he has these kind of, he has these very delicate hands and he kind of looks as if he's picking things up delicately. And what he tries to do, <laughs> that as he's saying these grotesque, shit-filled things as he speaks, that things that wouldn't, you know, you'd be surprised that came out of your ass, that as he speaks this, like, this toilet, that he has this hand, that he does this thing where he kind of counterbalances the vulgarity of what he says with these beautiful little delicate fingers that seems to be holding some tissue of, of beauty or some, like, maybe a little piece of gold leaf or something beautiful, yeah. while this shit comes out of his mouth. It's just... I mean, I think it's astonishing, actually. I think it's... Yeah, anyway. Okay, we, 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 we'll we talk about Ro Ronald yeah, yeah. McDonald's home. So, <laughs> what, is, what is Ronald McDonald, another key figure? What is he for you? Changed, for example, one of your bad jokes, Art Makes Free, into Arbeit McFries. Uh, uh, as a role for a piece of work, a kind of McDonald's restaurant camp. What, what, is, well, what does he stand for? Well, I think Ronald, Ronald stands for, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the, uh, an accelerationist trajectory from you know, the ideals of futurism. I mean, I was talking to someone the other day, I was saying, you know, this notion of the future. You know, think about science fiction probably peaked in, you know, 1970. Um, the notion that actually how we, how we view, um, you know, the notion of the future now is that we see it as a kind of an archaic, uh, um, sentimental, you know, we can have melancholia for the notion of the future because it was a, a, a genre of, of idealistic expectation. You know, the notion of science fiction now is kind of all dystopian, it's all kind of shitty and everything's awful and we're all gonna die. But there was a point when science fiction embodied the, the, the idealism of, of, you know, of an industrial future based upon some notion that you know, energy would be, you know, kind of, that, every, that there was this uto utopian dream that somehow all of the kind of secular differences and religious differences would kind of some, somehow come to pass and that would all congeal in this kind of moment of absolute modernity. Um, and if you, th I mean, I guess, you know, Ronald McDonald, for me, represented in some senses this, you know, what's interesting about what Ronald McDonald represented in the infancy of his beginning was, was this notion of 
cheap food for everybody, that Ronald McDonald actually was a Marxist. Ronald McDonald started life as, as, uh, as, as the, 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 the corporation tried to um, emancipate people from the kitchen, even in terms of the fact that actually you could buy your burger in your car, you know, the velocity of the future age meant that people, you know, why, why, you know, they'd liberated, they emancipated people from the kitchen. You could sit in your car and you go at speed and you could grab your burger and drive. So the, the embodiment of speed and velocity, you know, that they responded to that. What they wanted to do was also make people have cheap food. That there was an emancipatory discourse to McDonald's in its infancy. I mean, this you wouldn't understand that, you would not believe it. Um, that in some senses that it began life as something which was not inconsistent with an egalitarian model of, of production. Free food, cheap food for everybody. It had a, uh, a prog progressivist ethos to it. Now I'm interested in, her, in the degree to which this arc of this trajectory of this kind of smiling clown who suddenly lost his humour became the most litigious clown, you know, the kind of, you know, that. The, in a sense, you know, um, that what, what Ronald Donald can be is he becomes this kind of messianic figure who starts life full of optimism and ends up being this kind of, you know, uh, you know, vaguely, you know, he's kind of, you know, vaguely unfunny, very, vaguely, vaguely sad, sinister figure that's kind of consistent pretty much as far as I'm concerned with a kind of a trajectory of extinction. That there's this terrible arc where, you know, Paul Ronald actually recognises that actually you know, it's the end of the world, and that, you know, you, know, you can paint McDonald's green, and it still is not going to help. Is this the reason why he's so often crucified? In, yeah, well, in because I think that, you know, I think that, you know, in a sense that, you know, in some kind of fallacious sort of uh, Vonnegut type story, you could imagine that maybe, you know, part of the necessity of the Son of God to be crucified in order to produce some social cohesion in a guilt-ridden Christian uh, world, you know, mm. which is how kind of Christ functions, if some God offers no, God offers his son to be crucified and then everyone's guilty because they killed the son of God. I mean, that's a kind of a brilliant religion that starts off with the death of God. It's fantastic. It's mm. like religion backwards. I mean, I think that the thing about Ronald McDonald is that you can see that in, a, in, in, in the sense in which he started life full of optimism, full of I I idealism, full of this notion of a brave new world where everyone can eat burgers for, for nothing and that, you know, that actually for, for all, you know, in some kind and of poor, revolutionary poor farmers, sense, poor farmers, some revolutionary yeah. sense, that he ends up being the person absolutely consistent, the pariah of, of industrialization. He becomes a person who single-handedly is responsible for the end of the earth. So in a sense, he's been kind of thrown by the son, he is the son of industrialization that's been kind of thrown to the primal horde who will then crucify him in order to, you know. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting that yeah. he should be responsible for the end of the world. Poor Ronald, well, Mac, poor Ronald McDonald. Well, I mean, in terms, in terms of the kind of the discourses, of, the religious discourses of, 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 yes. of, of ecology anxiety, which have been kind of replaced uh, the discourses of, 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 of industrial endless energy, you know, the, 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 the idea of kind of like ecology anxiety is exactly the same, mm -hmm. kind of like another way of, 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 you know, that somehow the trajectory of, of, the trajectory of, of industry, the velocity of industry could be slowed down. You know, as though somehow, you know, as though somehow, you know, except some guy, some guy or some woman in some cave is rubbing sticks together, you have global warming. I mean, there's no slowing down. Because that's to do with some, to do with the possible relationship between what's physically possible and a, and, a, and a species which will overreach its own feedback loop. It can't, can't feed itself anyway, so, anyway. Mm. yes. Okay, maybe, maybe a little back to the, to the role model of the artist, talking about yeah. models. The role model of the artist seems to be important for you in, in general, not, it's not only Hitler's artist. And uh, uh, I've thought about Richard Prince as a young man, American artist. Richard Prince visited a, a concert of the Doors and the Whiskey Agogo in 1968. Do you know that story? Yeah. No, I don't know the story. No. Um, a story he tells on one of our picture discs. I'll give it to you too right. later. He, he was just out of school and couldn't wait to get away. So within 24 hours, he was in front of Morrison and, and the Doors and thought, this might be what art is about. Yeah. And he kind of agrees with Jim Morrison's definition of an artist as an erotic politician. So I was a little bit irritated when I heard that because the Prince 
seems to operate in the same framework like the romantics, like the Lakeland poets, Woodsworth, Coleridge, yeah. these things. And he lives in the in the middle of nowhere, uh, upside New York, in the near Woodstock. What, what do you think about that definition of artists as erotic politicians? It's not bad. I think it's. <laughs> Um, it's not bad, but I mean, I, you know, um, it's totally romantic. So totally yeah, romantic. Yes, of course. I mean, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, just as you're talking about, I'm sort of reimagining the, the rubbing the sticks together. I don't know why. Maybe some erotic. <laughs> uh, no, but I'm thinking that you know, if you think about the t the two trajectories of of the relationship between science and the relationship between art, you know, that you have in this cave, this dark cave, you have at least two cave people, you know. One of them's rubbing sticks together to try and make fire enough to light the back wall for the other one to do some lovely drawings of antelope or whatever, you know, on the you know, doing these lovely little drawings, and they're saying, "Come on, rub harder, rub harder." I can't see what I'm doing, you know. They're rubbing, then suddenly fire comes, and and you can see the trajectory of science comes from the rubbing the sticks, you know, that you know that all the world's resources are marshaled towards ever greater technological inventions, and you know, science being the kind of that's technology being the application of science and cars and da da da, and then you know, and there's the artist that you have this equal trajectory, both running in parallel parallel that the art, art is getting, you know, supposedly, you know, you go to Caravaggio, you go Giotto, Masaccio, Masaccio, Giotto, you know, Caravaggio, so that you get these beautiful optical drawings that are consistent with some point in, in uh, technolog technological evolution where you get some kind of greater understanding of the heliocentric relationship between the stars and the sun, you know. And at some point, you know, when you think that the tech, that the kind of the peak point of, 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 of scientific modernity, sends a man to the moon, you know, this moment when the, 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 the kind of the horizontal movement of, of, of science across the, the plane of the earth comes vertical in its utter embodiment of, of total resourced, resourced, focused brilliance that we exactly the same time there's a man chucking paint on canvas on the floor, it's not on a stretcher, chucking paint like a madman, you know. So, the idea that in the, in, the, in the moment of man's embodied manifestation of science, the man on the moon, there's a man chucking paint around. And when you think about that in terms of the evolution of art, the guy chucking paint on the floor, obviously Jack and Pollock, is actually less good art than the person drawing the antelope on the wall. Right. So the genius thing I think about is it demonstrates that one thing that can be regarded as important in terms of the notion of art is that it can retain its purposelessness. Even in face of this, if you make this diachronic line where you drew an illusion between the idea of scientific discovery, artistic discovery, that what happens is that the person who make, who's making this abstract expressionist painter, painting is, 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 is utilizing an absolute lack of skill purposefully in a way in which, the, you know, that for me is what art's about. Okay. <laughs> I found out that your, your favorite artist... Not sure if that makes sense. Art, your favorite artist, I found out that he stole Hewitt and Carl Andre, is that right? Yeah. Uh, I would expect people like Bocasi yeah. or Blake, but in fact it's Hewitt and Andre, yeah. the, the founders of minimal and conceptual art. Uh, has this got to do with their mechanical approach? Or what is the reason? I think it's to do with... Um, Building cubes. I think it's a lot to do with, and I like people like... Um, some Pollock as well. Um, I mean, I like it particularly for that point, that in a sense that when you end up with um, Carl Andre, you know, end up with Sol Lewitt, you end up with, a, with a, 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 an art form which seems indifferent to, to humanity. It doesn't become the embodiment of humanity as some kind of soft, uh, uh, some soft description of, of some you know, kind of humanist notion. You know. What happens with these works is that they actually seem bereft of humans. They seem to be, you know, I mean, I've always got another little, and I kind of quite like the idea of thinking that, you know, in the kind of the post-apocalyptic debris of the, of, of the earth, when there's just you know, singeing sort of, you know, billowing kind of debris, that when the Martians come down, the, the robot historians come down just to find out and see what has happened, and they, they rake around the, the, the debris of, of many, you know, modern art museums around the world, which are just simply kind of reduced to the, the foundations and the, you know, they, they will be stepping over Carl Andre sculptures without actually knowing that they were works of art too. You know, that for me is a good reason for, you know, that they're good artists. 
because they're kind of producing things which are not motivated by uh, an indulgence of, of, of humanism. Mm. They are actually quite brutally misanthropic. Mm. I, I love I also love the, the, the anti kafka story mm. of Gregor Samsa that you tell in the film The Organ Grinder's Monkey. Mm. Yeah, a cockroach, if you see it on, on the fourth floor, a cockroach wakes up as an artist or better wants to become an artist, maybe. It's, I thought it's more like Jonathan Livingston Seagull by Richard Bach. The seagulls that just want to fly without any purpose, just making art for yeah. art's sake. The cockroach leaves, as the story goes, the cockroach leaves its peasant friends and follows a drunken artist into his studio. All his dreams seem to have come true and then it gets killed under the food, the sperm of the wacky bean artist. What's, what's the meaning of this parable? Is it stay at home? I mean, it's, it seems to be as complex as Kafka's uh, metamorphosis. Yeah. Um. Is it a parable? Is I don't know. I mean, I think, I mean, I think, a, you know, I mean, you know, I, think I quite like, you know, someone like Beckett. I mean, it's Malloy or Malone, I can't, can never remember which one, I get confused. But there's one in which Beckett describes this person who uh, has a number of stones in his pockets, and he has a number of pockets, and he just moves the stones around, and he sucks each stone and puts it in a different pocket. And, you know, he's kind of describing a kind of, you know, that, that because there's a formal, um, procedure to this, a process of sucking and putting in pockets, that this person is, is, is producing a kind of complex, you know, complex language. But the language doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to have a purpose. It doesn't have to describe anything to anyone else. If, if, to be a language doesn't mean to say that a language has anything to do with communication. And I think that's a lot to do with, and I, again, would be my approach to thinking about work of art. You know, a work of art has no obligation to mean anything to anyone else. That's not to say that it has uh, some, you know, it, has the, it, it kind of expresses the sovereign rights of the artist to make it. Mm. But I think um, part of the problem with how, uh, you know, work, you know the, the, the relationship between viewer and a work of art is that the assumption, which is a kind of uh, uh, hand-me-down from the romantic notion of the artist as being kind of expressive, is that the viewer expects the work of art to be somehow confessional for it to be telling the truth. You know, um, yeah, I'm not sure I'm going to. I mean, I guess one of the reasons that me and Dinos started working together in, in, in as, a col as a collaborative, uh, collaborative, kind of what do you call it? Collaborative. Uh, not, we're a collaborative artist. Yeah, we're only half an artist each. We make up one artist. Because the idea that actually, when someone sees a work of art made by more than one person, they know that it's duplicitous. They know it's not something to do with being expressive or autobiographical, because then they have to then approach the work of art in a different way. Um, yeah. Would you say there's this difference between art and culture? Art is not culture is a prominent axiom by Jonathan Meese, view of art. Would you agree, or is art only an outstanding part of human culture? Is there a difference? No, I don't see there's a difference. I think, um, I mean, I think, I mean, I think one of the, you know, another reason I think art is interesting is because, you know, that somehow we've, you know, once you kind of contract, expand, contract and expand the, these notions of scale, you kind of say that, you know, for the single artist um, in the studio, that what's paramount for them is, to, is for the work of art to have something to say about them. You know, that somehow, um, you know, and yet you know, on a macroscopic, macroscopic layer, macroscopic level, you can see that, you know, that we are, of course, you know, a species, and that, you know, every little instinct that we have is replicated on a mass scale. You only need to drive down the autobahn along the Stuttgart autobahn to see brake lights heading off into the distance and realize that maybe what this is about is some idiot five miles down the road has, you know, too eagerly pressed the, the brake light. Then you get this kind of reflex mechanism whereby humans act like a species. The thing about making art is it's no different. I think all of the, the torments and the kind of existential crises that an artist has in the studio are only just reflex mechanisms. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I think is interesting about making art is, is that it, 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 it actually, rather than the, the conventional way in which a work of art is suggested as to how it operates, and maybe what Mises means by saying it's different to culture, is that it seems to be more governed by voluntary acts. You know, the idea of saying that, you know, when you're an artist, that you, the, the, the culture kind of secretes itself, it kind of emerges without kind of uh, intentional, authorial sort of activity, that it kind of, it's a, it's a mass production of something which is almost like, I mean, almost like a coral, human coral formation, it aggregates itself, it's, it secretes itself as an emergent entity. The thing about what an artist does is that it somehow 
self-convinced that it's something that someone wants to do. You know, that if I get a painting and I want this painting to mean X, Y, and Z, that the job of the artist is to believe that that's the case. And yet we all know, or those of us who are artists, and probably those of us who look at art, is that what art does more than anything is it demonstrates that that relationship between an intentionality and an act is actually severed. So more so than anything else, actually. But the idea in our culture is that we we glamorize the notion of the artist's intention, the, the idea of their authorship, because we need these kind of representations of humans being intentional. We need to have these kind of re representations of some kind of higher, higher motivation for our actions, you know, you know like that somehow mm. a work of art is the embodiment of, a, of an intention. But in actual fact, every work of art excludes the person who made the work of art. I mean, I've always said that, you know, I don't think you know, there are no works of art, there are no artists that belong to works of art, no, art, no, no art that belongs to works of art. You know, all works of art are delivered by the history that delivers the meaning prior to the artist. So no work of art is, is made by an artist. Hmm. Um, anyway, I got bored of that. Because it's an archive, or what, what's well, the reason in uh, well, no, competition with the, with the dead or... Well, I mean, if there's the kind of, you know, the, the infamous statement by Heidegger, you know, that la you know, rather than language speaks, you know, man speaks language, which is the assumption about how we, we treat language, mm. and he re re reverses it and says, you know, language speaks, speaks man. Us, yeah, and so he's suggesting that, you yeah. know, that, 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 you know, every act which is intentional is also sort of the subterf subterfuge of language which is speaking through the person. Mm. You know, when I think mm. I'm in my studio thinking, yeah, I'm going to make this, mm. and it'll mean that. Mm. Quite clearly, the meaning mm. inherent in the thing is kind of, is it, is it, it pre-exists my intention to make it, because even in order to make the painting, I have to go to the shop and buy the stretcher and the canvas. And the, so, the, so the work of art is already in momentum before mm. I've kind of decided upon what it will be or what it will mean. In actual mm. fact, it's probably neither of those mm. things, that I become a kind of a bystander to a process which pre-exists me. A language speaking through us is a very postmodernist point of view, I would say. And not, not reusing language, but, but language no gives us the opportunity yeah. to say what, what language well, it, makes possible. Uh, but yeah. I mean, I think, you know, if you kind of think about someone like Nietzsche, who was, who's discussing the will, you know, mm. he's suggesting that every thought has a will, you know, that, that language mm. in itself has a drive, mm. it has a libidinal drive inherent in language, so that when you think you're using language as, the, as an instrumental tool to express what you want it mm. to mean, it's expressing through you. Mm. Nature is perfect for my next question. Go on, then. Thank you very much. Pleasure. So uh, sorry, let's talk. Uh, I, it's a long question, hopefully not so confusing, but I think we come to the point. Is wild animals are an important part in your in your latest works? When I saw it in the studio, wilderness, pure life, and the endless eat and being eaten. You know, the dominant culture critique. That's what I want to talk about. I don't know a better word in English. The dominant discourse on culture, starting maybe with Marx and Nietzsche, later Freud, always goes like this, even yours and Jonathan's too. Uh, it goes like this. On the one hand, we have the facticity of nature, pure life, eat and being eating, meaningless, zero moral, no hierarchy. Yeah. And then there's human culture, value, art, the will to dominate nature. In the end, everything is hopeless because we are not more than biomass, warm food, hydrocarbon atoms, so liberation would mean liberation, liberating oneself from culture, biology as pure pleasure, pure fluctuation. I know it's a bit more complicated uh, than that, but in principle it goes like this. And uh, that's where the unbehagen, the culture, the uneasiness in civilization comes from. The problem with this kind of discourse is that the only thing you can do is to reproduce culture. There's no way out of the fly bottle. How do you deal with that fact? There's no um, well, I mean, you know, if you take, you know, Freud's Ex explanation for culture is something to do with all the shit that happens between being born and dying. You know, that it's a kind of, that it's a way in which, um, you know, that it's a kind of, uh, uh, you know, you can see the sort of the, the ornamentations of, of great cathedrals and wonderful works of art as being sort of these coral formations based upon this terrible anxiety that, that, um, you know that life is that life is is riddled with a sense of finitude. You know that in a sense that you know the, that that if you. I mean, I think you know that, again. Go back to Be Beckett. Beckett says a brilliant thing. He says you know you know this concept of God. He uses God. I mean, we can use God as a kind of a, a euphemism for finitude. But he, he, he questions God. He says, "What was God doing before creation?" You know, 
So, and, and also this idea of thinking about um, the relationship between, I mean, I would, I'd like to take up one thing you say about nature. I mean, I don't think there's a division between nature and culture because I don't think nature is a very good backdrop against which we can judge anything. You know, there's no, I don't believe we can have a concept of nature. I don't think there is anything which is uh, um, a thing which is not, um, you know, there's not a kind of, there's not an ideal code which stands unaffected by the world. But because that code can be affected by the world, given that we can kind of maybe genetically modify things, that's not an invasion upon nature. That's a, that's a possibility inherent in nature. So in a sense, that means that, uh, you know, pollution is nature, you know. The atom bomb is nature. You know, nature. If you look at the, you know, if the world is is a is a composite of of, of phys physical and chemical potentials. You know, we're only expediting what's available. And there's nothing about what we do which is unnatural. So that either means everything's natural or nothing's natural. You know. Um, hang on. Hang on. It's not the answer I expected, so... Um, uh, well, I mean, you know... <laughs> I think it's, it's about well, reproduction. Now, the culture has to do with reproduction and your rep reproducing Goya's it, etchings it, over and think, over again. Yeah, and but the, I think yeah. also, it's also, also to do... You know, culture is also to do with a sublimated... A sub sublimated time. It's to do with saying that you know, if you if you if you form a culture based upon some kind of perverse um, suppression of primary instincts, you know, mm -hmm. the, the idea of saying that you know, one of the things if you have kids, you watch them, they kind of you know, what's interesting about how we kind of project sort of idealistic innocence over children is because we kind of need that for ourselves in order to actually demonstrate the narrative from innocence to, to complexity. Whereas in actual fact, it's the other way around. Children are psychotic. They're not even human. They only become human when you force language upon them. Um, but the problem with that is that, is that, you know, the idea of saying that what we need to do in order to suffer the hideous intimacy that we live in is that we have to form ways of existing which are not governed by primary instincts. So that, you know, if I get on the bus and the bus driver's rude to me, I don't murder them, you know. And what I do is that I kind of I sublimate my anger by saying something witty, you know. And that culture is that. That's what culture is. Culture is a kind of a formation of um, angst-ridden ornamentations that are produced as a kind of a, a, a kind of a, a, a solidified spittle, a web, a kind of a mucus that's kind of formed in the interstice between being born and dying as a thing which kind of creates some mechanism which, uh, which kind of anticipates and negotiates and compensates for the other, which is just all out war. Mm. That's why I think where the, where the Unbehagen in, yeah, in culture yeah, comes yeah, from. Yeah. You know, the yeah. suppressed yes. libido, for, yeah. ex, for yeah. example. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, you know, I, mean, I think that you know, the, the, the thing is, is that you know, the idea of... The idea of um, uh, uh, sort of complex civilized culture is that it, you know, is, is that it contrives, what, what, you know, Freud's position on this is that, is, is that just a simple notion of friction, you know, that, that if, if desire, you know, there's no reason for de desire not to be super conductive, you know, mm. I want, I should have it, mm. you know, the thing about being civilized is that if, if I want, I have to find some sublimated way to find a compensatory object which is which will give me a percentage of the pleasure that I might get if I just grab it. So you know, so this notion of saying, well, how this comes about, you know, how it comes about that human culture has found ways of of of, of making um, the making an, a, a, a cultural economy out of out of denying its desire and yet sublimating its desire into ever more sophisticated and perverse forms. You know. oh. would, you, would you say that your work uses a special economy? Is it an exchange with whatever? Is it an economy? Is it, do you want to become uh, things meaningless? you want to bring things to the point where they collapse and 
I think that's a kind of economy. Well, I think that's, I think that's, I mean, I, I kind of, I, I want to avoid you saying that, because when you say it, I mean, I probably would have said it two minutes ago, but now you're saying it. It makes me feel like it, however much, because I think I kind of said that at the beginning, this notion of saying that you try and make the world, make these work that kind of collapses. Uh -huh. It still kind of, is still riddled with utopian ideas. It's still riddled with some kind of critical notion of producing something that by implication, is a kind of, you know, so the problem is, is that, you know, is, is how to make a work of art which kind of avoids any redemptive move to recuperate it, you know, to make something, you know, the only people who can do that are kind of psychotic serial killers, you know, they, they, they act in such a way where the action has no, has no social purpose to it. I mean, you can make all, you know, you mentioned Paul McCarthy, you can make the nastiest bits of art, you know, Mike Kelly can walk around shitting paint on the, you know, and however awful these things are, they're still recuperated to civilized conduct. Mm -hmm. But in actual fact, rather than the silly little person painting the watercolor of the, the river or, you know, Montmartre or whatever, that these works of art are, are preeminent in their ability to demonstrate how civilized and tolerant and liberal we are. They actually, mm -hmm. they, become, they become the moral justifications for a kind of a secular humanist society par excellence. Mm -hmm. you know? And this is the problem. The problem mm. is, is that, you know, part of, you know, the, 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 this notion of producing a critical art that seems to have teeth on it is mm. pretty much what a liberal society asks for because it, you become the, uh, the kind of the monkey, the little the organ grinder's monkey in a system where actually its tolerance is based upon how much you can test its tolerance, you know. The question of the artist is not to kind of avoid, you know, the question of the artist now is to bite the hand that feeds it because mm. primarily and, and, and perfectly the system is based upon transgression mm. as a function, as a function of, of, of the middle classes. This mm. is the problem. Mm. This is the big problem. Mm. You know? But by the way, was Daniel Craig really involved in that film? No. What? Daniel Craig was not involved in that film. The yeah, he was. He was he the monkey. Was, he was the monkey. Yeah, really? he was the monkey. I found it on the web, so really. Oh, yeah. how, how was he playing the monkey? It was a costume or uh, it was... was no, we had, a, we, had a, we had a robotic monkey and he recorded his monkey voice in New York. Okay. And sent it over. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Yep. So, um, uh, uh, we, we talked about Hitler, we talked about the role model of the artist. Um, Daniel Craig. We talked about Richard Prince. Richard Prince would yeah. be a good opportunity to talk about. Pedophilia is missing, I think. You often were accused. Yeah. Uh, and, and Jonathan Meese uh, uh, as well. I was on a uh, on a performance with uh, I saw a performance in Mannheim with him, and he was using an alien puppet yeah. in a performance uh, with a with swastika. Yeah. And well, and he I was mean, smelling between his legs. And I think it's the same with your fuck face. People always say yeah. pedophilia, but but we don't know anything about the sex of aliens. And yeah. I think the fuck faces puppets are apparently no children. That's quite clearly. Where do you think do these accusations come from? Is it preconceptual well, traps? No, no I think what I, is it? I think they I think they are they're not they're not they're not misidentified. They're not they're not you know. We have this game, I don't know if you have it here, it's pin, pin a tail on a donkey in, in England, mm -hmm. you know, this thing where you're blindfold. And I think the thing about, you know, the, I mean, I've always said that a, a paedophile is more likely to have some sexual um, feeling of pleasure by looking at an advert on TV that's selling diapers, which pictures a soft focus of a mother leering over her little cute child, you know, where the ambiguity comes in because in terms of how, how, objects, objects, inanimate objects are sold as they're sold with some kind of libidinal economy attached to them. So that, you know, so the idea of saying that, you know, you don't go into a shop where you just have, you know, A to B of objects. You know, a means, I can't think of an A thing, you know. But, you, you know, where the objects are just simply listed and you yeah. walk in and you have this utilitarian relationship, this instrumental relationship between saying, you know, I want, you know, T for toilet roll, take the T for toilet roll and use it for its job. That all of these things, every single object is, inv is invested with some kind of um, overtly sexualized symbolic value to it, which, which, which not only, not only um, satisfies the, the, the practical reason for the object, but it also provokes some kind of um, slightly sinister relation of desire. You know, so you don't only need a toilet roll, you want the toilet roll. You know, so, so the, what, what's, what, what cap capital does is, is that it, it, kind of, it kind of, it makes this very ambiguous relationship between simple, simple desire, simple need, and desires which are, 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 are intensified. 
So, I mean, I've always said it'd be very unlikely for, for a paedophile to find some kind of sexual pleasure by looking at any, one, any of our sculptures, because in a sense, they're fucking horrific. You know, they don't kind of, they don't lend themselves in, in, you know, to, to, to pleasure without you understanding that they are, um, they are aggressively um, active in their rejection of the viewer. Now, the thing is, is that, you know, I think that when people, you know, when people suggest these, these associations, I think maybe what they're doing is that they're kind of foregrounding a kind of, um, uh, a kind of a sense in which they're, they are kind of, kind of noticing that they're, 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 they're making a kind of, they're making a melodramatic moral claim about something which kind of maybe activates another kind of libidinal feeling that they might have about things that maybe, you know, are less straightforward, mm. you know. I mean, you sell a car, you know, nobody sells a car by saying this car's great, it'll get you from A to B. It's really good. You get in the car, you put the petrol in, you put your foot down, it'll get you from there to there, great. You know, all cars are sold on the, on the, on the premise of male phallocentric sort of virility. You know, this car is, it'll make you your penis the size of the car, you know. So, so everything is sold with an excess of, 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 a, of a libidinal, you know, because these are all replacements for the misery of the fact that we think we've given up primal feelings of sort of, you know, like of, of, of you know, sexual, you know, pleasure in favour of things which have become much more circuitous and much more elaborate, you know. Um, you know, you think about pornography. Pornography is quite, you know, the idea of, of the, the idea of something which is kind of supposedly some naturalistic act that is, you know, if if you you know, if you, I guess if people look at porn and it's just simply the kind of the the simple conventional in out act of you know, you know, associated with reproduction, people would be bored. But the idea of actually sort of turning the sexual act into something which is something you shouldn't look at but something you want to look at in kind of slightly obscure way, slightly, you know, that, that what happens is that you, 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 you turn, you know, that pornography becomes a, a, a form of culture rather than it is a description of, 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 of sex. You know, it becomes not about sex, it becomes about a rarefication of sex. In the same way as buying a loaf of bread is not always necessary to do with you need the fact that you need the bread. It might be something to do with the fact the way in which it's sold by... It's sold in such a way where it's appealing to your desire. You have to, under, you have to work out what desire means in, this, in, in this, this, this moment of exchange. And when you, need a, when you need a loaf of bread, you need it because you need to eat. But if you, if you buy the loaf of bread because you desire it, then what's being activated is not your necessity to eat, but it's, but it's your libido. Mm. I mean, I know why, why Jonathan Mies often uses this. It's a strategy to exclude the audience, to, yeah. to close it down, yes, yeah. Yeah, to see who can stand it, who yeah. is who's yeah, yeah. able to stand art, yeah. for example. Yeah. Yeah. Is, it, is it the same strategy yeah, with, so. with you and the fuck yeah. faces? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know... I mean, it's not shock. Shock is not working, working since 1945. I mean, Peter Berger points it out. Shock, so yeah, shock sure, is not sure, sure. It's not I mean, I think, you know, I mean, the idea of making a sculpture called fuck face, which, you know, that for us was, a, you know, we, uh, it was a very simple task. And it comes back to this idea of saying, how do you make a work of art which which would, would somehow evade recuperation. How can you make a work of art that, that, you know, however you approach it, it still can't be recuperated to some sort of, um, uh, you know, some, you know, that you could see it as being a comment on something else, or it's, it's really horrible, but it's okay because it's this, or it's, you know, it's a really awful, nasty Paul McCarthy sculpture, but it's okay because it's, a, you know, mm -hmm. that somehow that what we wanted to do is to kind of produce a work of art which was not, couldn't be argued for in critically, um, it couldn't, couldn't be paternalized, it couldn't be sort of, it couldn't be, uh, it couldn't be turned into anything else other than its own self offensive object. That you couldn't say, ah, oh, yeah, we, this is a really horrible object, but what it's about is something nicer, you know, mm. something more intelligent, something mm. more mature, something that can be recuperated to some sort of you know, kind of, you know, generative discourse about morality or genetics or mm. whatever. It, was, mm. it, it, it stays in itself. Mm. And in that sense, it evades this kind of, you know, this tendency to produce something for the purpose of something else. You know, it, it stops being Christian. Mm. I mean, excluding the audience is a, is a strategy, but it's a strategy of tonight's talks. So I, I, I would say we, I would like to open this conversation yeah. for the audience. So. Sure. Usually we have lots of questions and it takes 
half an hour or so. <laughs> Are there any questions? I, I don't know if you have a second microphone. Do you have one? Second microphone? Yeah. We found it. So here, here. Let's, let's. More questions. I'm just starting with the back. Well, what you just said um, about the bread and desire a bread or needing a bread. How could you? How could you make a difference? How could you separate desire from need? I'm seeing the point that if desires is a substitute, but if desires is just something which is enjoyable, pleasurable, that could be a need as well. How could you separate desire and need? Well, because I mean, I'm, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, the, the idea of saying that you know desire and need. I mean, desire and need. Desire functions to, I guess, to instigate need, doesn't it? I mean, you know, the idea of saying that I really, I would like a piece of toast, a piece of toast because I'm hungry, you know. You're connecting kind of a form of desire with a form of, of, of self-gratification. But in terms of how, um, you know, uh, an advert, for example, of a, of a woman feeding her child or, 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 or putting a child in a nappy operates, is that it, the desire operates as something which is, um, which is aesthetic, you know, it operates. You know, but you, you know, you look at the you look at the semiotics of of a, of a, of, a, of a advert. You know, they 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 sh the 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 one thing that an advert an advert um, activates is not the, util the utility of the of the of the of the circumstance. It operates desire before it operates utility. Now, I know what you're saying is that the idea of saying that you know that that when you you know if you need if you need a loaf of bread. That it's still there's still something which, you know, there's a kind of a self-preservation instinct that involves desire, but it doesn't operate in the same way. It's not in excess of need. You know, the idea of saying that when you see a kind of like a car advert, you know, it's in excess of need because it's, it just doesn't operate on need. So yes, <laughs> just agree with me. Just agree with me. Be polite. <laughs> I've come a long way. <laughs> More questions. No, you can you can ask you can ask, you can respond if you want. No, I think it's fine. <laughs> Thanks. Um, you talked quite a lot about the connection between art and madness. Um, I once read a whole book on the relationship between mental illness and art and how evolution hasn't edited out mental illness mm. because of this close relationship and how you can't have the peaks of what makes humans human, i.e. culture, without this proximity to a mental illness. Yeah. Um, so you're an artist, the question springs to mind, how close do you feel to the edge? But I'm not actually asking you this. <laughs> Be a bit rude, so I'll um, transform the question somewhat. Um, I've actually seen your work, Hell, before it went to Hell, at the show at the Royal College. Um, I think Ap Apocalypse was the exhibition. Yeah. Um, um, I felt quite close to madness looking at it. Maybe it's about being German and having to confront this. Um, you said it took you three years making it. Um, how did you feel? Was it fun? Were you totally detached from it? Or did you need therapy afterwards? Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, however I answer that could kind of fall within the paradigm of madness, wouldn't it? I, I, I really enjoyed making it. That would be probably mad. Um, I was really detached from it. That would be pretty mad. Um, did I have therapy? No. Um, I'm not suggesting by any means that to be an artist is that you are kind of, that, that by, by um, suggesting that I was surprised that, uh, that, 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 that um, you know, the, the, these kind of works by Hitler betrayed no 
no image, no, no, no pathology to them. I guess what I'm saying is that they, they don't betray a pathology that which, which is, the, is, as you said, the cliche of pathology. Of course they're pathological. And I would also say that, you know, to make art is, um, is I mean, I guess what I'm trying to do in terms of, of, of trying to distinguish between the two things is to suggest a kind of, um, uh, to, avoid, to avoid the um, romantic notion of madness. You know, of course, there's madness involved in making art. I mean, why would you? I mean, the, the problem with making art is that is that you're you are involved in 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 uh, you're you're involved in 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 the hopeful production of objects which don't really belong in the normal sort of form of exchange. You know, the idea of saying that you know if you make a painting or you make a work of art out of a brick, you know. That somehow your your um, hmm, now I don't know where I'm going with that a brick. Um, I think there's. I mean, I, I, I suppose that you know. I suppose that what I want to avoid is. I mean, I'm, I'm not suggesting that to be an artist is to be kind of completely logically connected with with the process and in control of it. I'm saying quite the opposite. But what I don't want to do is I, want, I don't want to fall into this notion that somehow that the that, that the that the specificity of the language of someone like Van Gogh is based upon some kind of haphazard represent, you know, haphazard activity which is just easily reduced to madness. I'm suggesting that the reason that Van Gogh is better than you know anyone else is because there's a specificity to the language which primarily is something to do with an engagement with language rather than just simply that, that madness has its own kind you know that madness is it's like firing uh, God, I don't know, something I'm completely, <laughs> I can't particularly this um, I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting that the reason Van Gogh, that Van Gogh is a great artist is not because he's mad. He might be mad, but the paintings have a specificity to them that's based upon, their enga based upon an engagement with art history, rather than just simply being a, 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 a kind of like an unbounded, unbounded expression or some kind of explosive outcome of madness. Those paintings are quite clearly not. They have a they have a, a formality to them which is very coherent, you know, and I think the same thing as the as, as the as the you know the, the Goya black paintings. They're not you know the idea of like pointing at those paintings and saying they're like that because he's mad belittles the 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 uh, the internal intensity of the work and the and the the engagement with the idea of art history. And I because I think that I suppose what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to avoid the idea that madness means being human. You know, I'm trying to talk about a kind of an idea of producing a work of art which doesn't overindulge the notion of being human before it indulges the notion of history. I'm suggesting that history is more important than than, than a, a caricature of the human who produces the work. I think. Um, and in answer to making the, the work for three years, it was horrific. I hated it. You know, it's not. I mean, but I think that's part of making the work. I mean, part, you know, part of the idea of kind of having to make these things for three and a half years. You know, these awful little. You know, you know, is that is that the the the, the humour of the work is wrapped up in the idea that we're subordinated to this task. You know, that there's nothing romantic about our activity. You know, there's nothing. You know, I don't kind of swan into the studio and kind of like throw myself around in a painting smock and go home and you know that it's just this dull, dull, dull activity. That it's kind of factorial. And, and you know, you know, unpleasant, and without any kind of romantic rewards, you know. Thanks for these really fascinating insights, and you, of, of course, seem eminently sane. Well, <laughs> but at, moment, the moment, I have my moments. At, at the moment, you have other people who work for you, so yeah, in the studio, there are they're all the assistants, and you yeah, can yeah. go on and bike yeah. with your motorbike and make all these oh. things. So you're absolutely free now. So. It was yeah, just I, with the first L. I only, I only employ people who have mental health <laughs> problems. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry for that notion. Yeah, so, right. <laughs> are there more questions? I mean, use the chance. So. How long did you do your research on the diagrams of hell? Yep. Um, we, the question was how long did we do research on the dioramas? So, thank um, you. The thing is, is that um, we only worked with what was available, you know. If you, if, you know, um, I mean, I can tell you know anecdotally, there was a the first one we made. Um, it was quite. I mean, we, so we had this conversation about making this thing, and um, you know, just this idea of 
producing this work on, you know, the, the, the idea of, you know, I guess one of the reasons that, you know, you could make, you could draw an illusion between my interest in someone like Carl Andre and our use of these little toy soldiers, that, I mean, in a, in a less kind of flamboyant pictorial way, that, you know, the thing about Carl Andre is that he uses, he uses pre-made, prefabricated things and uses these as these kind of units of artistic activity, like bricks and breeze blocks and squares and stuff. And so I guess that we approached, we kind of thought we were approaching it in the same way. How about making a work of art that only utilizes these toy soldiers? And um, I mean, I've, I mean I'm not to just descend into kind of base anecdote, but it is quite funny. Um, so I was sent to this, I mean, I had this conversation with my brother and I went to this kind of awful place, it's a, it's this toy shop in the centre of London, vast toy shop. It's kind of like uh, populated by really weird middle-aged men, you know, bumbling around, atomized, you know, kind of really kind of awkward. And it just, you know, these shelves filled with these toy soldiers and the, these things that you have to make, these little models. And I realized that if we were going to make this hell sculpture, we we're going to need like eight, 80 tanks, 90, you know, but I had a list. And I looked at this kind of, this, these, these shelves of soldiers and kits and stuff, and I just thought, fuck, this is going to take us like 20 years to make. We're not going to be able to do it. It's going to be impossible. Like, you know, we just really haven't really quantified the kind of the task in hand. And as I was looking at these things, just realizing that this is just not going to work. Because I mean, every little thing you have to glue together and, you know, every little hat you have to put on and hand, you know, I just was looking at just thinking, Christ, this is not going to happen. And, um, and I remember this kind of funny little man sort of sidling up next to me and he said, um, he just sort of, I just, you could see that I, you know, I had shock and awe, and I think he mistook that as something else. And he just said, he said, yeah, he said, um, he said, yeah, I've got, he said, I've got probably about two or three of every one of those at home. And I looked at him, and I thought, you know, he's kind of like he could be a serial killer, like a psychopath, some kind of crazy, <laughs> maddest person you've ever met in your life. And it really looked like, you know, that he probably he's, he, he looks at home in a model shop, but anywhere else you'd think, fuck, you know, keep well away. Anyway, so I couldn't help myself. I said to him, um, you know, I said, um, you know, do, do, you, do you want to sell them? <laughs> and he said, um, he said, no, no, you know, looked at me like I was mad. I said, look, look, here's my number. I gave him my number. And I said, look, if you ever want to sell these things, give me a call. I went home and I kind of went out, you know, came, went back to the studio and I said, you know, Dino, it's just not going to happen. There's no way. You know, it'll take us like about 15 years to even make enough of these things, you know. And then about three days later, I got a phone call saying, um, this guy saying, um, uh, you know, I thought about it, and um, you know, I would be prepared to sell them, even though they are my grand grandson's hereditary heirlooms. I'm prepared to sell them, and if you want to come round, you can have a viewing. And I thought that was like fuck, you know, that's yeah. So I said to Dean, I said, do you want to come with me? He's like, no way, you go on your own. So I had to get, I had to get a train. It was like the farthest reaches of kind of post East London, Ilford, like Dagenham. So I had to get a train and a taxi and I found myself in this kind of funny little remote cul-de-sac and found this little funny little house with lacy curtains and stuff and and I was I was genuinely nervous and I think I probably took about 500 pounds cash you know had that and I walked in and um and he was there with his kind of wife and they were they were like it was like really something like um out Bates Motel, they were really quite scary people, and they had they had like a little tray and a kind of carafe of whiskey and two and three glasses, like they were waiting for me. Then, in order for me to get a viewing of the of the models, all these little things and all these, like, you know, I had to sit and drink whiskey with them, you know. And they were, you know, and it was really. I was thinking, you know, I, could, I, could, I was looking at her, thinking, I definitely can take her out. No worries. I'm a bit worried about him. I don't know what he's sitting on. You know, I could definitely. There's a door there. I could, you know really working out my exit strategy. And then he kind of said, right, you know, would you like a viewing now? And I was like, oh, I don't know what viewing means. Does it mean, does it mean where am I going to have to go for the viewing? viewing? And he took me upstairs as his wife sat there drinking these little drinks of kind of, you know, looking at me like, you know, went upstairs and he opened this kind of funny double door onto this double bed. And it looked like, you know, those images of the road from Bras Basra, the Iraqi war, when they bombed the hell out of these convoys. There were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tanks and soldiers all laid out on their double bed. And I looked at it and I just, it was like, fuck, this is like 20 years worth of work. You know, this is, and I just kind of had to stop myself kind of like jumping. And I said, um, you know, I said, yeah, you know, I said, They're great, you know, um, uh, I'll take all of them. How much do you want? And he said, um, he said, uh, well, he said, the thing is, he said, I'm going to have to ask 50 pounds. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I mean, so I gave him a hundred because I couldn't give him more than that because he, you know, I would kind of edge him towards some sort of self-doubt about the whole deal. So I gave him a hundred pounds, and as we were packing the things up in these boxes that he had already, and I'd phoned a cab, and I was trying to phone Dino to say, "You're never going to guess what." Um, he turned around to me and he said, um, he said, oh, also, he said, could you not mention to my wife the, the extra 50? <laughs> <laughs> so in some ways, you know, that first sculpture burned, right, after two and a half years making it and probably 20 years of his work and I kind of feel somehow morally, morally resigned to the fact that perhaps we deserved it because I only paid 100 quid for them. <laughs> More questions? Or, yes, here's one. You talked um, at the beginning about um, representation and modeling, and now you, you talked about your research. And I'm wondering about, I recently learned that the Oxford English, English Dictionary announced a new word of the year, which is called post-truth. Uh, post-truth. Post-truth, yeah. Yes, would you consider a model or a representation, in that case, the how, as a post-truth? I mean, when you say post-truth, I can't help thinking of some village idiot climbing up the church spire and banging the bell, you know, to the accolade of some term which is fucking meaningless. Post-truth, when was there truth? When was there truth? When was there truth? It's like, it's kind of like, what, you know, does it, 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 I mean, the embarrassment of it is it kind of implies that prior to post-truth, there were people who were kind of like, you know, like follow, following like donkeys, you know, buying carrots to some notion of truth. Where, where was truth? I mean, especially associated, this term now is associated with politics. Well, because, you know, every time they asked Trump whether he'd kind of raped some woman and he said no, and she said yes, that they said, oh, this is post-truth. So, fuck. Really? What, he's the, what, Trump has been instrumental in, in bringing in this kind of new paradigm of post-truth. I mean, for fuck's sake. I mean, honestly. Jesus, sorry. I mean, post-truth. <laughs> God. <laughs> okay, I think it's time. Yeah, it's time. <laughs> I, I'm sure we could <laughs> ask endless more questions. Jake, thank you very much for coming. My absolute pleasure. I just want to say one thing. Yes, of course. Um, I really do appreciate that I'm speaking English and you're all listening in a second language, which is pretty amazing. And I have to apologize for the fact that I have no German whatsoever. I did read Nietzsche a bit, but you know, that's the best I can do. But I really do appreciate it. That's, how, that's, a, that's a quite a, you know, significant thing. Thank you.